You call your beloved cat to have his dinner. Sir Scratchy. Suddenly, you hear loud stomping. The dishes on the dinner table clink with every thump. A painting's fallen off the wall. Is it an earthquake? No, that's a cat the size of a pony walking into the dining room. It needs ten times as much food as the average cat. And it purrs like a tractor. No, Scratchy, stop rolling. You'll turn over the cupboard. Well, this is one possible scenario for the evolution of animals in the future. Climate, water, oxygen in the air, and even gravity are factors that influence the course of evolution. For example, scientists predict that some bird species will gradually lose their warm feathers. In the future, they will basically look like sphinx cats with beaks and wings. The same thing might happen to our pets. Gradually, their fur will become shorter until they're completely bald. Urban pests like pigeons and rats will become even bigger, the size of a cat. A few million years ago, rats were barely the size of your little finger. That's because they hid in small burrows and had to be nearly invisible to large predators. Now, they live in comfortable cellars that humans have built. They can create cozy nests there, and the large amount of food in trash cans keeps them from starving. So they feel quite comfortable and continue to grow in size. Even more, rats have already developed oily fur so that dirty or toxic water can run off them without harming the rodents themselves. Plant-eating mammals, on the other hand, might have it worse. Their food will gradually diminish. With time, there will be fewer forests and greenery on the planet, and some plants will disappear altogether. Eventually, animals like deer, elephants, giraffes, and others will get smaller and smaller because of the lack of food. In addition to shrinking, mammals will have smaller eyes so they don't lose water from their bodies, and their ears will become larger to lose heat through them. Their tails will grow longer to swat away insects. As land mammals become smaller, birds will increase in size. That's because they'll be able to include shrinking animals in their diet, and the muscles of birds will become much stronger because they'll have to fly long distances in search of food. Animals in hot and dry places are more likely to learn how to get water from the air. To do so, they'll need long sails or skin flaps. Early in the morning, when the air is coolest, moisture will accumulate on these new body parts, and some lizards will evolve their collars to a much larger size. Then they'll be able to collect more rainwater. As for the marine world, we can already see some fish jumping out of the water to catch insects. In the course of evolution, Fish fins may become longer and stronger so that they can leap further. And gradually, those fins will turn into wings to make them truly flying fish. Perhaps in the future, these fish will hunt small birds. To do that, they'll learn to hold their breath for longer and fly much higher. But the big fish and marine mammals will have a hard time. The ocean will heat up and some species will begin to disappear. The largest inhabitant of the aquatic world the blue whale, which is the size of two school buses, will shrink in size because there will be less food for it in the ocean. But the population of lizards and reptiles will thrive. They're good at absorbing heat. And with climate change, there will be more insects on our planet, which means more food for lizards. They'll start to increase in size. But now they'll have to defend themselves against big birds. Their legs will become longer and stronger so they'll be able to run a lot faster and not get eaten by a bird. And the insects? Well, they'll just explode. Insects will probably live in huge swarms and fly around looking for food. And they'll be angry and hungry because their usual source of food, mammals, will have either ceased to exist or shrunk in size. Humans will change too. Scientists predict that between 1,000 and 1 million years from now, we will completely lose our hair our limbs will become thinner and longer, and will be about seven feet tall. Our feet will most likely lose their toes because they're no longer needed to keep our balance. Our head and brain will become more like a balloon, and our lifespan will be more than 100 years. Because humans are at the top of the food chain and don't take part in natural selection, we'll gradually become similar to each other. In tens of millions of years, all humans will probably look the same. Plus, we're developing genetic engineering technology. Luminous rabbits, incredibly sized cows, 
web-weaving goats, super muscular pigs, and more. But we're more interested in how animals will evolve on their own. So, fast forward ahead in time. Humans have long lived on other planets and in other galaxies. Earth has long since become home to animals and plants. The only traces of humans here are giant cities made of metal and concrete that are buried deep underground. And up there, incredible creatures like the Necropteryx live. It's something between an ostrich and a vulture the size of an adult human. Its long and powerful beak is its main tool for protection against predators and for eating. Their strong legs with long claws make them excellent runners. This creature can walk dozens of miles in a day. Necropteryx needs warm fur or feathers. Without humans and the greenhouse effect, the temperature on Earth has dropped. But with a warm jacket, they'll be able to survive even a new ice age. And like ostriches, they reproduce by laying eggs. This is a Paris shrew. It's like a common shrew, a couple of inches long. But it has an unusual feature, a parachute on its tail. While little, they live in their parents' nests. But when they leave them, they launch themselves into the air and then open a parachute made of thin fur. The warm currents of air rise up and carry them. They can spend up to 24 hours in the air. Then they'll nest elsewhere and their babies will leave their home the same way. The waka, waka waka. This animal looks like a striped giraffe with only two legs. It'll be one of the fastest creatures on our planet. No predator can beat it in a race. Plus, their eyes are perched high on their head. And with its long neck, the waka can see a threat even when sitting in tall grass. Terabytes are descendants of termites that will appear on Earth in 200 million years. If they see a threat, they'll spew a stream of chemicals, something like acid, from their huge head. Even the biggest predators will be afraid to approach them. Reed stilts are about three and a half feet tall and weigh almost as much as an adult human. Thanks to its striped coloring, a reed stilt is almost invisible in the reeds. It walks on its thin legs through marshy terrain and feeds on small fish. Its long neck and sharp teeth allow it to dash into the water, almost cobra-like. It catches fish and swallows them almost whole. But all of these predictions are very speculative. There are billions of factors that influence the course of evolution. The course of evolution could go the other way at any time. For example, an asteroid hits the Earth, causing a mass extinction and changing our planet's climate. A small percentage of surviving organisms begin to adapt to the new conditions. In a few million years, we'll have animals that none of us could have even imagined. Feel that? The ground is shaking beneath your feet. Leaves are falling from trees. It feels as if a mini earthquake happens every few seconds. Bam! Bam! Something's coming right out of the woods towards you. There it is! The first thing you see is giant tusks and a long trunk. Then the creature's entire body emerges from the forest. This is the woolly mammoth. The species went extinct about 4,000 years ago, but now it's right in front of you. And it's not a dream. It might become possible in the nearest future. People are going to try to bring these animals back to life. And a group of scientists is already working on it. So, woolly mammoths appeared about 450,000 years ago in Siberia. Later on, they also settled in North America. Yeah, real estate was cheaper then. Then these animals took over Asia and even Europe. These guys were the tallest land animals during the last ice age. They were about 11 and a half feet tall. That's as tall as a one-story cottage. That's also one and a half feet taller than the height of the average modern elephant. But mammoths were much more massive. They weighed about 8 tons, compared to the 6 tons of an elephant. That's like 2 or even 3 big SUVs. Good thing they couldn't drive. Mammoths were so heavy because they had larger heads, as well as longer and more curved tusks. These animals lived in the cold tundra. That's why they needed a layer of fat that was at least as thick as a shoebox. But even that wasn't enough to withstand the cold. So mammoths had dense wool that grew to be as long as a cell phone charger cord. In the winter, the wool on the sides and belly of the mammoth formed something like a skirt, so the animal could lie in the snow and it didn't freeze. Mammoths spent most of their time looking for food, like me. 
To build up that thick layer of fat and keep their body temperature constant, they needed to eat about 400 pounds of food per day. That's the weight of two wild boars. But mammoths were herbivores, which means they ate grass and willow or pine branches. But after the Ice Age, the warming began. The tundra, where mammoths live, began to turn into swamps. The amount of food was decreasing. This caused a drop in the population of woolly mammoths. And now, scientists want to bring mammoths back to life. Using genetic engineering, they hope to recreate the mammoth using its DNA. Of course, this doesn't mean they will create the animal from scratch in a lab. First of all, they need a creature that resembles the woolly mammoth as much as possible. The answer is the Asian elephant. Both the mammoth and the elephant came from the same common ancestor millions of years ago. Their DNA is 99.6% the same. So scientists only need to add several missing genes to the elephant DNA. This will provide them with fur, necessary fat, long tusks, a large domed head, and other distinctive mammoth features. And the best news is that we do have the mammoth DNA. These animals lived in colder parts of our planet with never-ending winter. This eternal refrigerator has preserved not only mammoth bones, but also their genetic material. Scientists have managed to identify about 60 specific genomes that can help recreate mammoths. The most difficult step is to bring this creature into the world. One option is to remove some DNA elements from an elephant's egg and replace them with mammoth DNA. But this would require a surrogate elephant mother. It would carry the baby for about two years, and then the first mammoth would be born. But scientists question this option. Creating a herd of mammoths would take decades and require too many surrogate mothers. Another option is to make an artificial womb. Nowadays, there are successful cases of creating a sac in which an embryo can safely develop. The main problem here is the sac itself. It has to be large and strong enough. It'll hold a developing mammoth baby for two years. In the end of this period, it'll have to withstand the weight of about 200 pounds. But it's also important to remember that elephants live in a matriarchal society, just like mammoths did. And when an elephant is born, the first thing it sees is its mother. Their connection remains strong for many years as the baby elephant grows. So many people say that such a way of growing a mammoth is highly unethical. But scientists continue their research. They insist that their goal is to improve the already existing genetic engineering technologies and apply them in the future. This way, we can save endangered animal species. But why should we bring woolly mammoths back to life in the first place? Some scientists believe that these animals played an important role in the planet's ecosystem. These days, the tundras of Siberia and North America are gradually warming up and releasing a lot of carbon dioxide. This contributes to the greenhouse effect, which warms up our planet even more. These tundras are now heavily overgrown with moss. But thousands of years ago, when woolly mammoths roamed these areas, tundras were more like pastures. Mammoths trampled moss and felled trees. They were some sort of ecosystem engineers. It's believed that the return of mammoths to these areas might help bring them back to their original state. Restored pastures will keep the soil from eroding. They may even be enough to decrease the production of harmful carbon dioxide. Recently, ecologists have brought many bison and other animal species to the vast expanses of Siberia for the same purpose. But some scientists believe that woolly mammoths would do a much better job. If this experiment turns out to be successful, people would have an opportunity to bring back to life a huge number of extinct animal species. Unfortunately, there's a limit to how long animal DNA can survive in fossils. If these fossils are hidden a few feet underground, DNA can last from 1,000 to 10,000 years. If the fossils, let's say, are in the ice in the Antarctic, DNA can remain intact for several hundred thousand years. Unfortunately, it means we would never be able to recreate dinosaurs. They went extinct about 66 million years ago, and people just don't have any access to their DNA. But we could bring back some animals that disappeared not so long ago. Like moa. It's a species of flightless birds. The largest of them was as tall as the woolly mammoth and weighed as much as a scooter. But the smallest species could be the size of a turkey. They lived in New Zealand and were isolated from the outside world for almost 80 million years. But they became extinct after the first people arrived there. Or stellar sea cow. This was the largest aquatic mammal after whales. These sea cows were as long as a limousine, and they weighed more than African elephants. 
Stellar sea cows had a very lazy lifestyle. They lived near the shore and ate algae, mostly seaweed. Scientists believe they didn't even know how to dive. Even though elephant birds were indeed birds, they couldn't fly. These creatures were twice as tall as an ostrich and weighed 10 times as much as the average person. They lived in Madagascar and, like ostriches, laid eggs. Although elephant birds became extinct almost a thousand years ago, people still find their eggs. Scientists managed to get the DNA of these animals and analyze it. It turns out that the closest relative of the elephant bird is the kiwi. It's another kind of non-flying bird about the size of a domestic chicken. Pinta Island tortoises used to rest for 16 hours a day. They also drank a lot of water and could store it like camels. Each animal has its own role in the ecosystem, as well as in the food chain. The disappearance of one animal can cause huge problems for others. Such a chain reaction can wipe out an entire ecosystem. For example, dinosaurs didn't disappear instantly after the meteorite collided with Earth. The impact caused fires all over the planet. This decreased the amount of food for plant-eating dinosaurs. When they disappeared, meat-eating dinosaurs began to starve. And then all dinos gradually vanished off the face of the Earth. Many scientists think people do need genetic engineering technologies that can bring back extinct species. The pace of climate change on the planet is getting too fast for some animals to keep up with it and survive. Human intervention in this process could save many lives. This technology might also help recreate people if something happened and all life on Earth got wiped out. Mm. If we could preserve our DNA, our species could be brought back to life. Um, by who? The term time capsule was first officially used in 1937. Although the idea has been used much longer, whether deliberately or unexpectedly. The first organized time capsule was planted in 1879 by a magazine publisher in the USA. This century safe was an iron box filled with important objects of the time. They hoped it would be opened 100 years later. However, as the decades flew by and the location wasn't properly recorded, it was almost lost. But after thorough research, they soon found it just in time for the USA Bicentennial Celebration, providing some nice relics from the 19th century. Including a gold pen accompanied by an inkstand and a book on the Guide of Temperance. There were also a collection of autographs from many notable people and a photograph of then-President Ulysses S. Grant. The oldest time capsule in Europe was found in 2020 in Zembitza, Poland, but completely by accident. Workers were repairing the spire of an old church when they suddenly found a sealed copper canister within. It was filled with books and other papers dating to the 18th century. The pristine papers confirmed the capsule was placed there on the day the church opened in 1797. It listed all the people involved that constructed and funded the building. The documents showed that at the time the village was called Munsterberg and was part of the Kingdom of Prussia. But curiously, there were other papers included that dated from 1902, along with photographs and coins. These were likely added when the spire was last renovated. The builders were also probably surprised by the capsule, but later also wanted to leave their own memos before completing the repairs. The documents have all been copied, replacing the originals in the spire. And to continue with the tradition, the townspeople placed similar objects from the present day. The northern coast of Canada is a strange place to find a message in a bottle, deep in the Arctic, where there are not a lot of people venturing that way. But one geologist, Paul Walker, placed one inside of a cairn in 1959. A cairn is a pile of man-made rocks that's used as a landmark, and within it, he put a special request for whoever found it. However, cairns are very common and used to mark significant areas. So, unfortunately, Paul's message wasn't discovered for a long time. It wasn't until 54 years later that some scientists discovered it. Overjoyed by finding the message, they learned that Paul was researching the movement of glaciers. His cairn was used to measure the distance to the glacier. In 1959, the distance was about three feet. The message requested them to record their measurements, and the scientists were more than happy to comply. 
the distance had increased to 330 feet. Paul also asked for any information to be passed on to him. His contact details were also included. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible, as it had been too long. But the scientists put the message back in Paul's memory, and even added their own letter for anyone else that finds it in the future. The Detroit Century Box is a time capsule organized by prominent citizens in 1900. In the box, they piled in letters and photos, with a lot of attention to the technological state of their city. They wanted to provide a comparison of their time, along with their predictions, for 100 years into the future. Upon opening it in 2000, it was found that they expected the population in Detroit to increase significantly. With residents up to 4 million, it was actually a pretty close guess. The population of Detroit at that time was 3.8 million. They also expected that travel will be available through flying machines or some other similar methods. But there were other predictions that were a bit off, where they expected pneumatic tubes would also be used as transport, and that Ontario will one day be part of the USA. But of course, it remained in Canada to this day. In Nebraska, you can find the world's largest time capsule, although it's scheduled to be opened in 2025. In 1975, Harold Davison obtained a massive 45-ton vault and gathered a collection of around 5,000 items to put in it, hoping it will be opened by his grandchildren so they could experience what life was like for him at that time. Once he completed it, he claimed that it was the largest time capsule in the world. However, this title was already taken by another one in Georgia, so Davison built a large pyramid on top, which also kept it more secure. Built in front of his furnishing store, it quickly became a local tourist attraction. It's well known to the entire town, who anticipate the day it's dug up. Most of its contents are unknown but people are expecting letters from friends and neighbors, providing an insight into what they were thinking and doing in the 70s. There are also records and tapes to show what they were listening to, and for the grandkids, a Kawasaki motorcycle and a brand new Chevy Vega, or at least it was at the time it was stored. A time capsule in 1981 buried by George Lucas contains many objects from the Star Wars films, with merchandise and toys of all the main characters, and books showing stories and footage from the franchise. Although there's no date for it to be opened, they would like it to be opened in about a thousand years. It will be quite the experience for the people in the distant future. The world will be significantly different. The world of Star Wars will likely be forgotten, unless they make a thousandth sequel. But for the future people who review the sci-fi technology depicted in the films, will they assume that this was a vault from a fallen civilization on Earth? And as they witness the weird and wonderful characters, they might even think that we had some form of communication with beings from outer space. In Central Park in New York City, you can find Cleopatra's Needle. This tall granite obelisk was first erected in 15 BCE but was later gifted to the USA in 1881. And for generations, it has stood as the oldest human-made object in Central Park. But little do people know that there's a time capsule beneath it. There's no date arranged to open it. With the obelisk on top, it would make it a difficult task. Possibly the intention is to keep the time capsule there for a very long time. But records state that it contains a U.S. census of 1870, a dictionary, a complete works of William Shakespeare, a guide to Egypt, and a copy of the Declaration of Independence. The man who arranged the obelisk purchase also placed a secret box in the capsule. As long as the 70-foot high, 200 tons obelisk stands there, the time capsule will remain unopened. The aim of a time capsule is to preserve objects that will stand the test of time, ensuring they're later discovered. That also provides clues towards cultural meaning and historical significance. Archaeological evidence with the help of technology can also help understand these things, even from prehistoric times. 
In the northwest of England, an entire village was found in a field near the village of Poulton. It dates back to the Iron Age when its contents provided some perception of what life was like, with some of the best findings from pre-recorded history. Several houses with pottery and coins helped us understand that Poulton has been an active town dating as far back as the 8th century BCE. A further inspection of the pottery reveals they were used to carry salt, which they collected from a mine 18 miles away. Poulton was clearly a wealthy and populous area, thanks to actively trading along a river system. Although finds like this weren't intended to be time capsules, it shows just how the littlest of details can reveal what life may have been like. What would you put in a time capsule that best depicts the present day?